Mike Sprague is director of the Wilson Center's Polar Initiative, and Romy Cadiente is the relocation coordinator for the Alaskan village of New Talk. Gentlemen, welcome to Now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. I should tell our viewers that uh, you will be joining a session here that Mike's Polar Initiative is hosting in a couple minutes, Fleeing Climate Change, Relocating the Village of New Talk. Not hyperbole, the title says it all. This is remarkable. We're talking about an entire village that's not just moving, but the village as we know it now will cease to exist eventually because of the impact of climate change. If you could describe the impact. That's actually correct, sir. Um, the village is eroding uh, at an alarming rate of 70 to 90 feet a year. But not only uh, the flooding, but when you have a, a south wind uh, and, and the high tide, what it tends to do is it floods the northern part of the village. So consequently, you have these two problems. Not only that, the permafrost is melting. So you have these homes and everything that are being twisted, that are being waterlogged, that are eventually being eroded um, and fall into the river. And that's kind of hard. We need to do something now. I know this is mostly a human story, mm -hmm. and, and I, but I, if we could spend a moment on the science, the permafrost. Could you talk to us about what permafrost is? Sure. Yeah, permafrost is frozen ground for more than a year, in simple terms. So there's continuous permafrost where the land is just one layer of, of ice, soil frozen. And on and top then, of this top is of additional is, soil where the village correct, sits. Correct. Yes. But that has been stable for as long as people have been in the region. What we're seeing is permanent permafrost eroding not only by the river eating out the, the uh, permafrost from the riverbank, but also just the climate in the Arctic has changed, twice as warm as the rest of the globe. So you have this double whammy of erosion, flooding of permafrost, that frozen soil, and you have the general atmosphere warming, the general climate of the region warming. So really what we know as stable, what villages have built on, what civilization has built on in the Arctic has been stable for humankind. However, now it's a totally different game. We've built villages, roads, industry, railroad, all on what we thought were normal, stable, predictable environments. Mm -hmm. And those have not only changed, but they've changed rapidly. And this would be the time of year where we'd be well into the refreezing, right? And it's not happening yet. The temperatures are still above average. They are. As a matter of fact, that's a good point because a while ago we could predict um, with, with almost certainty when the river would freeze, that would give us... Um, and, and, and new talk in the communities around the area are subsistence based. So when you have um, a river that is frozen, seal hunting, um, uh, uh, fish uh, catching and stuff like that, we could plan that. But now, like when we left, the, the river was supposed to be frozen already and it's still not yet, mm -hmm. um, which leaves us with a real big problem. Is it safe to travel? Um, and, and going back even further than that, um, the weather, the climate is getting more, the storms are getting more severe um, and they're getting non-predictable. You see a, before, you could actually look up at the clouds, it'll show you if the wind is coming in. And when the wind is coming in, if you look out to sea and everything, you see uh, you know dark patches, you know that takes shelter right away. It doesn't do that anymore and it's getting really unpredictable. R Rami, your position, uh, relocation coordinator, not a typical municipal position. Yes, sir. Uh, created obviously for specifically a reaction to this situation. How long have you had the job and when did it become apparent to, to the people in the village that this was a necessary uh, hire? Um, I've, I've been working with the, the village council for about four and a half years uh, and prior to them, uh, the the vice, uh, pre president and the vice president actually gave me a call because the village knew that we needed to do something um, really quick. There was nothing um, that was being done at the current time. Um, and, you know, w people were getting afraid. They were scared of losing their house, their community, and everything else that's associated with that. So they knew we had to do something. And that's when we sprang up, you know, into action. You may be the a precursor to a whole new uh, line of work for a lot of people as this continues to, to spread. The, uh, I, I want to ask you about this notion of you can move houses and you can move individuals. But you were talking about a way of life. Can you move a way of life? 
And, and that's the thing that what, what the village community wanted to do about this. If we don't do this, um, and if the possibility of having a village move to another community far, far away, what happens to their identity? What happens to your culture? You can actually put a village over there and if they decide to come back, where is the people without that sustenance? It's just a place. Right, right, and you t and uh, uh, Romy talks about uh, subsistence living off the land. Mm -hmm. You know the land intimately. Mm -hmm. Now you've got to learn a whole new landscape. Well, it, it is, you know, there's been a rhythm of life and the communities in, in Alaska and throughout the Arctic and elsewhere, even the Pacific Islands, that rhythm of life runs their life. Culture, language, food, everything, song, dance. And so when you move to a different landscape, things change. Now, it's lucky enough that, that Rotovic, the new location for the village, is relatively close by. Across the river? About nine and a half miles. So regionally, in, in my opinion, it's relatively close. So the rhythm of the landscape, it's not mm -hmm. what it is in New Talk, but it is close enough. The, the, real, the real interesting concept here is who gets to say? Where, where are the decisions being made? Here is a village that within a year, two years, could possibly be not livable anymore. So when Romy goes back to his home in a few days, it will be a different place, literally. So who gets to say where this village goes? Who gets to pay for it? What does it look like? How is it created? Different Who does? How far are we down the tracks in answering yeah. those questions? Romy? Actually, uh, right now, uh, had a real good construction year. Challenging one because it was our very first, but we actually built a road uh, from the quarry all the way down uh, to the village, the new village. Uh, we built a man camp uh, that could host about 30 workers, um, got running water, which is the very first for that, that area. Um, there's there's a uh, cafeteria where the guys can enjoy a hot meal and you know take showers and whatnot, but I, and we're already starting the process of building homes. Um, we've shelled four houses already this year. Didn't have time to finish the interior, so the guys are going to come back and stuff and finish um, the uh, the interior next year, which is really important because. In order for uh, federal agencies uh, to engage the community, the airport, the school, et cetera, you, one of the requirements were, were to have at least 25 kids. Right now, we're, gonna, we're having about eight homes there. We hope to meet that threshold to engage more federal mm -hmm. agencies. So what, what about levels of support from the state and then the feds? The state, uh, the federal people uh, were fantastic. Uh, you have uh, the Denali Commission, uh, BIA, HUD. Uh, these guys were all fantastic. We're working with the state and everything to implement some more programs. But this thing is so complex, so intricate. It's, it's really hard to nail down when there's not specific grant uses for the type of construction that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the challenges. Mike, one of the questions you're probably tired of me asking you is about sort of the level of awareness of the Arctic and Arctic communities over time in this town and in the pol public policy agenda. What about this particular issue? How high is this on the radar screen of members of Congress? Well, certainly for the Alaska delegation, it's almost top of the list. I mean, there's this, the issue of where these villages go, not just New Talk, but there, there's, a, there's around three dozen villages now threatened in some ways. Mm -hmm. So for the Alaska delegation, it's front and center. Uh, the main delegation, Senator King, fully aware of this issue. Both Senator Murkowski and Senator King co-chair the, the Arctic Caucus in the Senate. So there's pockets of awareness. But in terms of on the rest of, of congressmen and congresswomen, senators, it's, it's not high on the list. There's, there's not that much of awareness. There's this mythical change happening in the Arctic uh, in, in different regions. But until it hits Miami, which it has, and until it hits Louisiana, which it has, and until you see the rest of the country experiencing change at a dramatic rate, whether it's fire or drought, then now other senators, congressmen, now start raising the issue of what is this thing called these uh, sort of steady, 
slow disasters. We all know about hurricanes, but these slow, gradual disasters, which is what you've had in New Talk and elsewhere, have now got on the radar screen. So it's very important for us to keep that awareness. Uh, Romy, I saw you on, a, on an NBC piece where you, you said, uh, let me, I wrote down the quotes, this is a war and the time for debate is over. Thinking of what Mike just described as far as the political debate around climate change, where there are still people who are deniers, there are others who are taking this sort of leisurely approach, let's wait and see, the science is uncertain. What do you have to say about that? And it is a, uh, it is a war, but this, this piece has been talked about for so many years already. It started with, you know, uh, Vice President Gore and, and some of the work that he's done. There's, there's just a lot of information that was published about this. And I hate to say this, but climate change is here. There's no room for talk anymore. There are villages that, are, that homes are going into the water if this does not happen for, there are 31 villages right now in Alaska that is experiencing the same problem. Let's do, guys. No. We, so many times when we discuss climate change, it's always in the hypothetical or mm -hmm. what might happen or what. You're describing scenarios, not just in Alaska, but other places yeah. that are underway currently. Is, the, is your sense of this, since you've been immersed in it, is the debate changing? Uh, it's, yes. So there's, there's more awareness, but not the kind of awareness that you need. You need institutional awareness. Well, not the sense awareness. of urgency, perhaps. That yeah, correct. Correct. Requires. Until it hits population centers, and that's what you're starting to see, the big hurricanes, the big storms. But what we're talking about here are slow-moving disasters. These have been going on for decades now, whether it's in the islands or in Alaska or in the Caribbean or elsewhere in India, monsoon changes. So this idea of change happening and it's starting to impact populated areas, that's what's different about this. We have been raising the, the alarm, the signal for decades. How, the new village, the, the, is it also built on permafrost? No, uh, that's the thing that is really different. This is actually uh, built on volcanic rock. There's a lot of rock there, the ground is stable. And what's neat about this is there's fresh water, a lot of fresh water, uh, when you drill down and stuff. So it's a great place to live. What is the timetable for completion? When does everyone need to be out? That's a real good question, and we don't have that answer right now. Um, we're just, you know, uh, getting as, we have a team of three grant writers right now that are looking for any type of funding, uh, any type of opportunity, and we're just going after it. And what about, what about the citizens of, of, of the village? Uh, are, are they eager to make the move? Are they, like you see in many cases, you talked about hurricanes, people don't want to leave their homes. They are. They are really eager to move, as, and they're scared. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of residents that have been moving to nearby villages. Not only that, but there was one lady that said um, in, in a meeting um, that she would not stay here at the, at the storm season, and this is the fall months. So what she actually did, and this is all documented, she got her tent, she pitched it over there at Mertave. It was getting cold. The guys, the contractors felt really sorry, uh, and they landed up moving her tent into a conix, plugged some electricity in, but then, you know, you got with the heat issues. But that's kind of the level of how afraid these people are about losing their property. Yeah, Mike, I think you wanted to say something a little earlier. And I was I just going to say that I think it would be helpful for Romy to explain sort of what, what the issues are in terms of water security right now, the way in which you currently get your water, the sanitation, the way in which you live versus the way in which others live and how that might change moving to the new village. Um, at the current time, um, if you take 20 steps, that's how much we have left till we lose our water. There's another 35 steps till you lose a home. So we're, we're, the, the clock is ticking literally. Yes, this. sir. My, when we were uh, preparing for this, when Mike told me you were coming and we talked about setting up the interview, he mentioned the fact that people who travel from your village uh, don't know if they'll come back to their home, literally. They don't because they're afraid of the storms. Um, they're afraid of the conditions there. When it floods towards the north and everything, what it tends to do is it, 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 the floor of everybody's home, uh, people on the north, uh, get waterlogged. When you get waterlogged in a nice cool area and stuff where it's not disturbed, there's a haven for black mold. 
That's why the village of New Talk has the highest incidence of influenza and respiratory problems. And that's just part of the challenges, no. not to mention the flooding, erosion, the permafrost, et cetera. But people are getting sick. And we need, as a tribe, we need to provide for these people to a healthier environment. As, as whenever something like this occurs, mm -hmm. and you, you call this a slow-moving disaster, you see when there's an acute disaster, earthquake or, or, or hurricane, there's an outpouring of support, charitable donations. Are, are you the subject of that kind of support? We haven't seen any yet, um, but really why we're here and everything is to spread the word that this climate change is very real. And if we don't do anything right now, then the dislocation, the bad word for a lot of Native communities. Mike, is this something that is going to require that kind of uh, all levels of support, not just the federal government or the state government or local uh, resources? Yeah, I've, I've called it the, sort of the climate change Sputnik. This is the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be federal, state, local agencies, NGOs, the public coming out to try to figure out not only for new talk, but what's the overall strategy for, for communities like this, not just in Alaska, but, but elsewhere in our country that are battling these slow moving disasters. It has changed. And so I think very much so, like you see the, out, but, but you have an incident, you have a big hurricane and flooding and a lot. And so it's on CNN all the time. Right. So that's a call to arms for communities that are, you know, don't, are not in the mainland. It's hard to get the message out like we've seen in just recent days. Well, if somebody was watching this interview and wanted to help, is there a mechanism for them to, to help? Not at the current time. Um, and I think we need, we probably need to, you know, set something mm -hmm. up, Mike. Yeah. yeah. There we go. A yeah. future, a future project. Not that you don't have enough to do. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the logistics, but mm -hmm. I, before we close, I do want to get, talk more about preserving a culture or the, in, the, the experience of the native people, the Yupik Eskimos. Mm -hmm. what, I know there are plans to build homes and there are blueprints and there are ways that you can do that with hammers and nails and, and wood. But back to the whole cultural question. What are the plans in that regard? Is there a way to preserve a language, to preserve a way of life? Keep them together. Keep them in their communities. Keep them where they know the area very well, where they've been living for thousands of years. And Mike, these cultural impacts are something that are sort of farther down the line in public policy discussions that tend yeah. to be technical. Correct. They are farther down the line. Using public policy, you're looking at you know infrastructure, streams of streams of finance, financial uh, support, those kind of things. The, the policy implications. But when you talk about a culture, I mean, it, these are people who have lived there, hunted the grounds. Again, the rhythm of the landscape is the rhythm of the people. The, they're one and the same. And so, to dislocate them off the off the landscape is to dislocate them from their very being. Rami, you know, sometimes in, in the job that I have where you ask questions of people who are either expert or completely immersed in a situation as you are, you can feel a bit inadequate about your ability to relate to someone's very, very visceral experience. So I want to give you the last word. And what do we need to know? What do you want people to know about what your village is going through uh, that those of us who don't live there and aren't experiencing it firsthand can't possibly understand? Climate change is very real. And whether you look all around the world, it is impacting us directly. And if we don't do anything right now, there are severe consequences uh, to the human population, to the indigenous all over the world, that's gonna happen. We need to start now. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope this uh, puts a dent in that, a in that effort to get people more aware and more active. And uh, it seems inadequate, but let me just wish you best of luck. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Romy. Mike, thank you as thank well. You,